So once again, thank you everybody for attending. Um, welcome, super excited about this particular webinar um, on managing stress. I know that I need a lot of help managing stress. So I can only imagine what you all are going through as college students during this pandemic. So super excited for this. Uh, really excited for our presenter, Dr. Kendra C. Hart. Really wanna thank her for helping us out with this webinar. Uh, Dr. Kendra, Dr. Dr. Kendra C. Hart, is known for uh, advocacy is known for her advocacy for youth with disabilities, mental illness, and environmental psychosocial stressors. Uh, her two-decade career as a school psychologist expands several areas, including education, public health at the Centers for Disease Control, and juvenile justice. She's been a consultant for LA Parent Magazine, and she is an adjunct lecturer for North Carolina State University. So please join me in giving a virtual round of applause for Dr. Kendra Hart. Thank you so much, Gus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I can see your hands, that's so cool. Um, I am excited to be here today. I'm excited to share with you all some of the things that I've kind of um, come to learn about in my journey in my own personal life, as well as my research interests and things that I've learned about from the, the empirical evidence and just kind of share with you all. So I hope that we will have a lot of time at the end to uh, have some conversations if you'd like, and we will have some opportunities for you all to participate. Um, so I hope that you all will do that as well. And I, I really appreciate the Fulfillment Fund for having me here today. Just a little bit about myself. Gus um, told you a little bit about my professional life, but let me tell you a little bit about me personally. I do live in Los Angeles, but I hail from the South. I'm a Georgia peach. So I um, moved here about five years ago and I really, really am enjoying my LA experience. I came here kind of on a journey knowing that I needed to have some personal and professional growth. I enjoyed my life in Georgia immensely and love going home. Um, prior to living in Georgia, I went to graduate school at NC State University and lived there for about six years. And the reason why I'm telling you about that experience is because I want you to know that that was one of the most trying experiences of my life. Um, I grew up in what I would imagine um, to be a typical home and everything seemed to be, you know, kind of going on. I had regular life experiences. I was coming into knowing and understanding myself as we do developmentally. And then about 16 years old, life kind of came off the rails for me. I had a whole lot of things that happened to me, um, unexpected, and it just kind of seemed like between 16 and 21, it was one thing after another, I, I kind of felt like the universe had me in a back boxing match. And in that experience, um, I really began to understand how things can begin to break down in our bodies. And so in, in graduate school, um, I experienced major depression and anxiety for several years. And I am not ashamed to say that because that's a part of my story. And that also is what qualifies me to talk to you today about some of the things we're going to talk about in terms of stress management, because I'm not going to tell you anything that has not worked for me personally. And I sit before you today as a very healthy person, still a work in progress. And I'm hoping that if some of you all are struggling with some of the things that I have struggled with, that you will find meaning in what we talk about today. So let's first get a little bit of an idea about where you all are right now. Gus has a survey he's going to give. Um, if we were in person, I would have you kind of raise hands and things like that. But virtually, we have some cool technology through our polls. So we have a poll here to kind of just give us an idea of who you all are and where you all are right now. So if you'll take a few minutes to do the poll, and then um, Gus is going to share your responses, and then we'll move forward with our session today. Let's take a few minutes. How are we doing, Gus? Are we about there? And now I can't, we, we have quite a few questions, so it may take you a little bit of time.
Hope you all are doing okay. I know that this is a very crazy time, um, but I'm hoping that we're kind of coming through um, and have been through the worst of it is my hope and that we'll, we'll find our way to shore pretty soon. We have about 10 people who haven't voted, so we'll give them maybe another 20 seconds if, if they're hoping to vote. Okay. And then we'll go ahead and close the poll and I'll share the results. Okay, sounds good. All right, so. How many years have you all been in college? It looks like we have kind of a pretty diverse group here. Um, some of you all are in your first year, some of you all are in your second year, some are in your third or fourth year, so or four year plus. So sounds like, again, we have a good mix of different college experiences here and different levels. Let's see, how I feel that I have people in my life that I can turn to for support. Looks like the majority of you feel like you do have people you can turn to for um, support with, um, I'm not going to do the mental math because I just don't do that, but the majority of you over, um, well over 60% have us in the um, agree or strongly agree. I am enjoying college. Let's see. 40% said neutral. And the majority of you are actually agree or strongly agree. So it looks like the majority of you are, are enjoying college and I'm glad to hear that. Fantastic. So we're going to talk about strategies today to help you continue to enjoy college. And for those of you all who are not, we hope that some of these strategies will help you um, to have a better experience, not only in college, but in life um, in general, because that's what stress management is about. It's about helping us to be able to cope with life. Life has a lot of amazing things to offer, but it also can, as I share with you in my personal experience, it can throw you some whammies at time and which can cause you to derail or at least kind of move out of the pace that you want to be in. And so we want to learn about how we can relax, relate, and release and manage stress in um, college, in life, and especially during a global pandemic. Again, that kind of ups the ante. College has its own stressors. Life has its own stressors. But we are collectively going through a whole new experience right now. So during our session, we're going to discuss some of the common contributors to stress in college and beyond. We're going to examine how stress affects your emotional and physical health and explore strategies on how to manage stress. And then we're going to practice a few of these strategies um, in terms of techniques um, that have been well supported in reducing stress. First, let's talk a little bit about the function of stress. You know, stress gets a bad rap. When we hear about stress, we don't want to be stressed. Um, we know that it can have negative in impacts on our bodies. But why do we have stress? Well, from an evolutionary standpoint, stress is there to help keep us alive. So we'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. But that, that's the first function of stress. Stress helps us to know that we're in danger, that something is wrong, and we need to move out of that situation, which is why it has an impact on our body. The other function of stress is it helps us to have optimal performance. So even if we're in a situation that's exciting, that we're enjoying, like me today talking to you all, or you're getting ready to compete in a track meet, or you're getting ready to do a project for your class and present to your class, or at work, it helps you to kind of increase enough of the hormones to get you to optimal performance. What we know in terms of um, Yerkes, Dots, and Law, and if you've taken an intro to psych class, you've probably heard of this. If not, um, no big deal. The, the idea behind it is what's important. And the idea behind it is that 
once we cross a certain threshold, a, a certain threshold of stress, then our performance level goes down and we start experiencing things like fatigue and exhaustion. We're not able to think clearly. And that's when we know we're in a place of stress that is unhealthy. So a little bit of stress helps you get that paper done. It helps you um, not procrastinate, but too much stress can kind of shut you down. So what are some of the college stressors that we know are very, very prevalent? I don't know how many of you all have heard of imposter syndrome, and um, you may not know this term, but more than likely, many of you have experienced it. It's so very common. And that is the idea that you really doubt your abilities. You're wondering if you're a fraud. Like if everybody else gets it and everybody else does well, and you're just kind of faking it, like you may have made it to college, but are you really good enough to be there? Or you may get an accolade, but did you really deserve it? So it's that imposter syndrome. And the interesting thing is, is that so many people in high level positions in all types of positions feel this way. So it's a very common experience. So if you find yourself in your classes or your day-to-day -day activities feeling like, man, do I really fit here? Question yourself, because more than likely you are experiencing imposter syndrome, which can stress you out. Spotlight effect is the tendency to overestimate how much other people are really paying attention to you. So the reality is that we're all walking around as stars of our own movie. And I don't know if your movie is a drama or a romantic comedy, but we're, we're, we're stars of our own movie. So oftentimes we're thinking other people are paying attention to us and our mistakes and our deficiencies, when in reality, they're very preoccupied with their own. So that spotlight effect, especially in college, it begins to um, really take an impact in middle and high school is very, very real. And we can continue to have that throughout life. Cognitive dissonance is the idea that there's something inconsistent about how we think or feel or believe things should be or believe that we should be behaving in the way that we're actually behaving. And so how do we experience that? You know, almost every night when I go to bed, I'm thinking in the morning, I'm going to work out. I even visualize how amazing it's going to be. And then that next morning when I try to get up, uh, there's some dissonance there. I don't want to do it. And then I go through the whole day feeling bad about myself because I did not work out when I, in my mind, I'm a health conscious person and I should be doing that. Same thing with your assignments. You know, you want to be a good student. You want to be studious, but sometimes getting the motivation to get things done just really um, can be a challenge. And there's some dissonance there. And then you have the everyday life stressors like school work demands, um, high expectations, maybe you've placed them on yourself, maybe your family, maybe your teachers have placed them, relationships, they can get wonky at times. And so that impacts the way we're feeling because those are very important to us, our responsibilities and pressure. So trying to, again, balance everything that we need to do. Um, money, financial aid, you may be thinking about student loans, you may be looking at your bank account, and wondering what's going on here. And then overall uncertainty. You know, we set goals. We want to see ourselves accomplish certain things, but there are times when life has us doubting ourselves and we just don't know how things are going to turn out. And during COVID-19, a lot of anxiety came around uncertainty. How long are we going to be in this pandemic? How is it going to impact the um, economy? Are there going to be jobs? You know, what is this going to look like? And so that uncertainty is an increased stressor in college. And a lot of these um, life stressors have been even further exacerbated during COVID-19. And there's a lot of research that shows that um, everyone, but especially college age um, individuals, are having some challenges with coping with the changes. And so there's been spikes in anxiety and depression and suicidal ideation and substance use and all types of things. And I don't know if that's you or not, but I want to make sure that we have strategies that we can talk about today so that it doesn't have to be you and that if it is you that we can work our way through it. So what are some factors that amplify and diminish stress, meaning they can go either way? Let's talk about it. Number one, thoughts. 
That probably is pretty much a no brainer to some of you all, um, but it's, it's deeper than what we think. And so what I mean by that is our brains are constantly moving, constantly moving. It's just like a chatterbox, chat, 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 chat. And you're not always aware of how that chatter is impacting your feelings. And so one of the most important things to do is to be aware of those thoughts and challenge those irrational thoughts that may be increasing anxiety. And when I say irrational thoughts, that's thoughts that oftentimes fate feels fatalistic, like, or oh, I'm never going to succeed, or I always make a mistake, or no one ever loves me. Those fatalistic statements that are very extreme. And if you really, really take a look at them and challenge them, you'll see they're really um, not founded in truth. You also have statements um, and beliefs such as everyone else is better than me, or I'm never really going to be happy, or my family um, doesn't support me, and therefore I'm probably not going to be um, successful. And you don't know if those thoughts are really true or not, but sometimes they're deep-seated beliefs and they impact the way we feel perspective. You know, we hear the, um, the statement, are you a half full or half empty person in the way that you look at life in terms of, you know, are, thing, are, you, are you having a tendency to look at what's going well, or do you tend to um, perseverate on what's going wrong? And lots and lots of research has shown that m the majority of human beings tend to fall in the latter, where we focus on what's not right, and we can totally um, miss all of the things that are good. And there is a survival component to that. And so that our brains are kind of our brains are kind of wired to be able to notice what's wrong. And again, that's a part of our survival, being able to um, continue to live. We want to be able to notice what's wrong. But in terms of our overall mental health and the way that we're able to move through life and stress, that is a technique that we need to learn in terms of how to shift and focus on the things that are good. So perspectives are super duper important comparison. We get stressed out when we're on Instagram and Facebook and other social media sites and we see all these things that other people are doing and accomplishing and we're looking at ourselves and wondering, well, what's wrong with me? And the reality is there are people who are looking at you and all of the amazing things that you're doing and they're thinking the same thing about themselves. And we all know that we tend to post what we want other people to see. We want to post our trip to the beach. We want to post, you know, some fabulous outing that we've had, but we don't generally, some people do, but we don't generally, you know, post our moments when we're at our, our saddest um, um, times or really frustrated or anxious. So those same people that you may be compare, uh, comparing yourself to are experiencing many of the things that you're experiencing expectations. So again, we want to have expectations. We want to have goals. We want to rise to those expectations as much as we possibly can. But we also have to monitor the expectations. Are they realistic expectations? Are you going to write that paper in 15 hours when most people it takes about a week? You know, you want to look at what are your expectations so you're not putting unnecessary stressors on yourself. Relationships. Relationships like all of these can be something that diminishes stress. So you can have people that you can talk to, that you can um, work through different problems with, that you can have fun with, but they also can amplify stress based on what they're saying to you or the dynamics of the relationship if they're causing stress. So relationships can cause stress and they can also relieve stress depending on the dynamics. Experiences, we oftentimes are seeking and pursuing positive and healthy and happy experiences, but life can give us just the opposite many times. And so our ratio of experiences can also impact our um, levels of stress. Connections is like relationships, but it's not the same. They are like relationships, but they're not the same. So when I say connections, things like your social networks, are you a member of clubs? Um, are you in any sports? Again, during 
um, the pandemic, that's kind of diminished, but are you in any online um, platforms? All of these things are, are ways to be connected, but they can also cause stress. And what I mean by that, um, a, a key example is, since I've been in um, Los Angeles, my mother keeps trying to convince me to join um, my college alumni association. And I said, when I go to the meetings, it's always about fundraising, so I gotta pay money and being on committees, which is gonna give me something extra to do. So if it was social, that'd be great. But most of the time, those connections cause me stress. Um, and then habits, the things that we do every day, our habits are what build our life. And there are a lot of great books out there about this, but the main one is we oftentimes look out forward and we think about what we want our life to look like and we take um, all kinds of efforts to set goals and long-term goals and short-term goals where the experts and those who are really successful have realized that if we just implement daily habits that align with our goals, we're much more likely to get there. Meaning that we're waking up in the morning with a morning routine that's going to set our day on a positive footing, that we are um, making sure that we have physical fitness added into our day and that we have healthy eating habits, that we make sure that we get ample amount of sleep, that these things are just a part of our habits, that we stay connected with family and friends, that we set schedules, that we have these habits that align with where we want to go. And if we're able to do that we and, and it's habitual, we don't really have to think about it as much and we don't have to stress about it as much. So those are the factors that amplify and um, diminish stress. So for a minute, I've been talking, I want to kind of hear in the chat or see in the chat some of the things that you all are doing now. Um, what are your current stress management techniques? What are you all doing now that are help that is helping you all to kind of manage stress? And stress is, again, something that we all deal with. It is a part of life. Um, so it, it's not some people are stressed. Everybody is stressed. It's the level of stress that you may have and how you are managing it. So I want to kind of get a look at what you all are having out there. Okay, I'm seeing some pretty cool stuff. Um, some of you all are doing mindfulness, taking walks and exercise, jump roping. I love it. Um, dance class. Awesome. Drawing. Awesome. Dancing is one of my favorite stress management. Um, painting and working out. Self-care through meditating. Awesome. 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 So journaling. Very good. Gardening. I have a good friend who loves to garden and that's his favorite pastime. And he's always teasing me because he calls me the plant killer. But I'm going to I'm going to make him teach me um, some gardening skills. Cooking. That's one of my favorites. Love to cook. Watching shows. Yes. Binge season has been upon us. Exercising. Wine. OK. Retail therapy, yoga, walking, sunbathing. OK. You all have some great strategies. Listening to music. Fantastic. One of my favorite as well. Baking, TV, yes, you all have some great strategies, as I knew that you would. So, and those, and and there's no real right or wrong way to handle stress. It just has to be a healthy way. So, um, some of your uh, responses fall in some of these main categories, and this is not an exhaustive list. It was just to me a cute graphic that kind of captured a lot of different areas that I felt like many of your responses would fall in. Um, exercise and physical movement literally helps to regulate our stress hormones and give us the feel good hormones that we want. Hobbies. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about mindfulness. I saw um, some a few of you all mentioned that um, meditation and yoga. I want to talk about nature for a second. I want to highlight that because again, I'm coming from from an empirical standpoint and as well as a holistic orientation. Whether or not you consider yourself an outdoor person, there's so much research that shows just some time in the sun, allowing the sun to hit your skin, um, to be outside and breathe fresh air. Walk around barefoot if you can, if you have um, some grass nearby or if you have a beach near you. 
that connectedness with the earth and being out in nature naturally brings down a lot of the stress hormones. So I recommend it highly. Um, if you're not a nature person, just go sit out on your uh, porch or balcony. Uh, you all don't have as many porches in uh, California as in the South, but get get that good sun and, and, and enjoy that experience. Again, it naturally brings down um, your stress. Music and time management, all of these are just ways to kind of manage stress in a healthy way. And if you're feeling like none of these are working for you and you're continuing to experience high levels of stress, then I would recommend that you consider therapy. I um, will say that one of the things I wanna do is dig deeper um, today because I felt like you all would have um, a lot of those great stress management techniques and just talk about your relationship with yourself. Because again, that is a huge part of managing stress. And it's something that you all sound like you may probably be doing a little bit better than I was when I was in college and graduate school, but I wasn't nurturing it. And again, this comes a lot of times from different family experiences. And the way I was brought up, um, we were a very service-oriented family. That's what we did. And I was brought up to believe that a lot of my value came from what I did for other people and loving other people and being giving to other people. And I still believe that. I still believe that being of service to other people is good. What was modeled for me, however, in my home and what I took on for myself is that I had to be everything for other people and that my needs and who I was um, as a person was less important. And that's what I'm hoping that you all are not experiencing. And if you are, we're going to deal with it a little bit today. So I um, did have the self-sacrificing mentality because I felt like that's what it meant to be a good person. Um, so putting other people's needs before myself. And if I did ever feel like I needed to put my own needs on the list, I felt that that was being selfish. So I had to um, really begin to challenge some of those beliefs because it got me to a point of extreme burnout and an empty cup. So when I first showed the slide with the contributors to stress, beliefs being a huge one. So you want to always be examining your beliefs. Some of them are well-founded. Some of them will be supported and you'll be like, yeah, I think I'm on the right track with that belief, but some of them you need to challenge. And so I hope that as we talk about some of these things, you will begin to really connect with yourself and think about where you are and think about the areas that you can possibly improve in terms of taking care of yourself, because that is the relationship um, that you must nurture first and foremost going through life, because that's who you're with all the time, every day. And so now I'm in a place where I do feel like I put my needs on the list and I am self's best friend. So we have great conversations. We hang out all the time. I give her pep talks. I, I nurture her as much as I possibly can. And so I am a recovering people pleaser. I am a re covering person of self-deprecation and self-sacrificing. I am recovering from all of that. And so I hope that you all um, will do the same. So I like this. Um, give yourself the same care and attention that you give to others and watch yourself bloom. So in taking care of your needs and putting yourself on the list and checking in with yourself each and every day and saying, you know, how are you doing today? What do you need? Um, what can I do for you to get you in a better place? And if something has happened that's kind of really kind of shaking you, taking a look at that and having compassion on yourself and saying, dang, that was kind of disappointing or that was pretty tough. What do you need today to kind of get yourself back in, in, in the right state of mind or in a better place? And I, it may seem weird to have those conversations with yourself, but it is crucial to have that level of intimacy with self that you would think is just kind of intuitive and it's, it's just how we're built. It really isn't unless you're trained to do 
do that and or or you're just naturally really really in tune with all of your feelings and sometimes you may have to dig a little deep and say i'm feeling a little anxious what's making me feel that way or i'm feeling a little disconnected what's making me feel that way and 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 usually when you have that self talk you can you can dial it back you can say oh yeah that that statement that comment that you know my mom made the other day it kind of rubbed me the wrong way and i didn't really process that or you know when i was in the grocery store, I, I saw something that kind of disturbed me and I didn't really process that. And so you'll get to know what is um, interfering with your calm and identifying those triggers for stress. I believe wholeheartedly in holistic well being, meaning we have to keep the balance in all areas of our life. And if we're out of balance, that begins to um, signal stress in our life. We'll begin to feel stress when we're out of balance. So you all are in college right now, and I commend you for that. And college can be a fantastic experience. I know many of you said that you're enjoying this experience. But don't put all your eggs in the college basket and your professors and, and everybody may not like me for saying that, but it's the truth. You want to make sure that you are still nurturing yourself um, spiritually, thinking about meaning and purpose. It doesn't have to be religious, just kind of what works for you spiritually, that you're taking care of your basic physical needs. Um, when I moved here, I was working around the clock. I was um, spending 30 hours on one psych report. It was just insanity. I was going nights without sleeping and it took a toll on my body. And so you want to make sure that you're balancing that and say, is it really worth it? And, and trying to um, do some time management so that you can take care of your physical health. You're working towards your professional goals. Make sure that you call your friends and your family members who mean something to you. Um, because Again, we can get so wrapped up in the day to days of our job, of our, our education, that we forget some of those things and some of those people that are really important that can help us to keep that holistic well being and oftentimes are good mirrors for us to tell us how we're doing in our life in terms of balance. So we're gonna talk a little bit about stress and its impact on the brain. So in the chats, how many people can tell me physical things that happen to you when you're stressed out? What do you feel in your body when you're stressed? So in the chat, if you can talk to me about some of the things you feel in your body and your, when you're stressed, some of the ways that you know that you're stressed, what, what happens when you know that you're stressed? Okay, stomach aches, tight shoulders, your stomach hurts, that adrenaline rest is real, you start sweating at times. Yes, headaches, definitely, I get migraines, I totally, tension, you feel it in your body, in your shoulders, in your neck, absolutely. Become sleepy, you know what, um, Angela, when it gets overwhelming, I just want to go to bed. Oftentimes, I really want to go to bed. And so I feel you with that. Um, but oftentimes, at the same time, when I go to bed, I can't sleep because your mind is racing. And so that's another signal oftentimes that I am stressed is that my sleep is interrupted. So Jennifer said racing thoughts. Exactly. Exactly. A lot of stomach aches. There's a lot of research that talks about the brain and gut connection. And um, how really the, that our stomachs are, they say maybe even the first brain, but it's definitely um, connected to the brain. And so our emotions, oftentimes we feel them in our stomach um, even more than when we feel them in our brain. That's why a lot of times when you're nervous, you may kind of get, you know, butterflies in your stomach or you may get um, bubble guts, not a pleasant experience, or you may... Um, lose your appetite or you may get really hungry. So a lot of our emotions are tied to our stomach. And so paying attention to that. Passing out is, is definitely saying that we've got to learn the triggers before we get to that point so that um, so that you don't pass out, so that you can kind of begin to moderate the experiences before that. Stress eating. Oh my goodness, I can relate. Um, nothing soothes me like some good old carbs, although I always regret it. When I say carbs, I'm not talking about the good ones. I'm talking about the ones you're not supposed to eat in abundance. 
Um, so insomnia real. So why do we have all of these um, physical symptoms of stress? And that goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the presentation, that stress is a signal to our body that something is, um, that something's wrong, that we're in danger. And so some of you may have learned some of this in some of your classes or just through your own research, but I'm going to kind of talk through it so that we can all be on a little bit of the same page. So in our brains, our brains, if you think of them this way, um, here, if you look at this picture, is considered your prefrontal cortex. And here is your brain stem. And here is kind of the older part of your brain, which is considered the hind brain. And this is the, when you think about evolution, our brains kind of developed from the back up. So this is the uh, more sophisticated part of the brain. And this part of the brain is, again, if you think about times of Neanderthal or maybe we were running around with the uh, dinosaurs, we were constantly having to be in survival mode. And so whenever we feel threatened in in any way, this more um, primitive part of our brain really lights up and goes into survival mode. And it sends a signal um, from the amygdala, which is always watching for threat. Um, we don't even know it. And it's, and it's the thing that if somebody walks out in front of your car, you'll hit the brakes. Um, it's called a reticular activating system that'll notice that before you even perceive it and you, your body just responds. So that is always looking for threat. And that's why you can notice when somebody looks at you the wrong way. And it can be a slight glance because you're always picking up um, detectors in the environment. And so your amygdala then sends a, a signal to your hypothalamus and says, hey, and they're both located in that um, hind brain. We're in danger. And the hypothalamus says to the rest of the body, all right, let's get it together. We got to get out of this situation. And so it ignites what's called your sympathetic system. And your sympathetic system is the fight or flight um, that says we've got to get out of this situation. So either we're going to run real fast and get away from danger, or we're going to have to put up our dukes and we're going to have to fight. And so what it does is it sends um, hormones throughout your body and your heart rate begins to increase and your stomach shuts down because your stomach is a part of the parasympathetic set, um, uh, system. We'll talk about that in a second. And things that... Um, help with your immune system shuts down because we don't have time to be focusing on immune system or reproduction or eating. We need to get out of this situation. So the parasympathetic system, which um, basically runs through the autonomic system and helps keep us alive in those ways, shuts down so that we can put all of our energy to get it out, getting out of threat. And again, when you're in a, in a wilderness situation, you have to run and you have to fight. That's fantastic. Even if you're walking down the street and something happens and you have to run to get out of danger, it's awesome that our body is built that way so that we can get out of danger. However, the problem comes when our body recognizes threat in so many different ways that we're not really physically in danger, but we're always in this fight or flight mode, which begins to um, create kind of a toxic soup of cortisol and adrenaline, which are good hormones when you're really having to run fast or get strong all of a sudden, but they really do begin to break down our body when they can't escape, when we can't get back to the parasympathetic um, autonomic nervous system, we can't get relaxed and we can't find our homeostasis, then we begin to break down the body. And that's when we are in a situation of chronic stress. And that's when we start um, having mental health issues like anxiety and depression because our body has stayed in this state of having to um, really survive in survival mode for so long that it can actually rewire your brain so that it stays in survival mode. The good news is that we have strategies that can take our brain out of survival mode. And this, um, because of neuroplasticity, we can actually rewire the brain so that we can um, actually be a different person. It's amazing how much, if we're intentional and we use strategies, we can shift out of um, survival brain. And if and many of you, I'm sure, have had experiences of trauma because I just know the prevalence rates that by 18, um, the majority have of us have experienced some trauma. Um, some of you may have grown up in situations where you're 
were in um, a constant traumatic situation. And so that survival instinct within you was never able to rest. And that chronic situation of um, trauma or stress can be overcome. But again, this is maybe a time when you wanna see a therapist if you're having difficulties doing it on your own. Some of the strategies we're going to talk about today will kind of be like an introduction to these strategies, but I definitely encourage you to dig a little deeper because you will find um, that they have great benefits in terms of just quality of life. And again, I'm speaking from experience on this one because I went through major depression for at least seven years. All right. Chronic stress. So we talked about kind of how it impacts the brain and how the brain um, responds. And again, that mind gut um, connection where they are constantly talking to each other. Um, when we're in a stressful situation and in survival mode, again, digestion tends to stop and we the, the body is using all of its resources to get everywhere else to get us out of, out of um, stress. So we have the rapid breathing and that rapid breathing and the blood having to be pushed to all of the parts of the body and the, and the heart having to overwork in time can wear out the heart and, and include, increase the risk of heart attack. Um, again, when you're in fight or flight mode, you're in survival mode, your body's saying, hey, we don't have time to be thinking about reproduction right now. So it can be related to fertility problems or um, sexual dysfunction because again, your body is saying we cannot be thinking about pleasure right now, we are in survival mode, whether you are or not, it can interrupt your sleep. Because again, if you're being chased by a tiger, that's not a time to really be asleep. So your body's gonna say, no, 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 we're in, the, in survival mode. And why are we feeling this way if we're not being chased by tigers every day? And again, you may live somewhere where you feel like you're in, in um, jeopardy and your safety is threatened or you have those experiences. But many of us, Things like a car cutting us off in traffic or someone speaking to us in an aggressive tone or giving us a look that um, threatens our sense of well-being or the, the nervousness that we have that if we don't do well on this assignment, then we might not do well in college. And if we don't do well in college, then how do we get a good job? If we're not going to get a good job, then will we be able to supply housing for ourselves and, and feed ourselves and our families? And so there, there's the link to survival, right? There's always a link to survival. But again, the way we're processing these thoughts can be adjusted so that we can begin to move through them and move back to the parasympathetic part of our body. And when we do that, when we do that, when we figure out how to calm ourselves and take ourselves out of survival mode, then going back to our um, brain, we're able to start activating the prefrontal cortex, which is more analytical. It's more of a problem solving. So um, part of your brain, so whatever has you back here in survival mode, you can actually begin to think of solutions when you're in a more relaxed mode. So it has many, many benefits in that regard. I want to say, um, again, for those of you who have had significant trauma in your past, that the good news is that, again, you have a lot of power in terms of your ability to reshape your experience of life, to heal from the trauma. So the trauma does not have to be your full life story and your full life experience. Um, there's actually... A, a phenomena called post-traumatic growth syndrome that shows that for those of us who are able to heal from our trauma and able to find our passion and our meaning and our um, balance and things like that, we have some things in our, in our wheelhouse in terms of skills that people who didn't go through trauma may not have. And one of the ways to think about it is if you lift weights, um, how your muscles are built um, it's through the tearing. So when you lift weights, your muscles tear and then they repair themselves and they grow back stronger. So these are individuals who have significant traumatic life experiences, have experienced chronic stress, and yet they were able to overcome it. And they were able to um, 
find some healing and some passion and some purpose. And, and it doesn't mean that it all goes away overnight. It takes a lot of work sometimes. Um, it, and it depends on the person. But the good news is that there is definitely hope out there. So I encourage you to read up on your famous stars, um, your favorite stars and things like that and learn about their, their life experiences and what they've overcome. All right. So we've talked about kind of what are some of the major stressors in college and in life, how it impacts our bodies, our brains, our physical well-being. We've talked about some of the techniques that we use that um, are effective in helping us manage stress. And the last thing we're going to do before we kind of open it up for discussion is talk about some stress management te techniques that you probably are familiar with and some of them that you're not. So we're going to just talk about them. And again, I, I prefaced um, my talk by saying, I won't give you anything that has not worked for me. And the interesting thing is I'm kind of stubborn. So some of the things that I had read about that I even taught my clients to do, I was not doing them. And then when I actually started to do them, it had a life-changing impact on me. And I was like, who knew? This stuff actually works. So again, if you're like me and you're just like, oh, self-care, do this, do that. Um, I promise you it has changed my life immensely. And I hope that you will um, find some of the strategies helpful and you don't have to incorporate all, um, but you can. So the first strategy I want to talk about is self-talk. One of the things we talked about was that chatterbox. So right now, I can't see you, um, but I want you to just take a minute and pay attention to your thoughts in the last 30 seconds, if you can remember them. Just what are you thinking? Were you thinking about what I was saying? Were you thinking about something going on in your life? Were you thinking about something you have to do? So just take a few minutes and actually think about what was I just thinking? Pay attention to your thoughts. So awareness is one of the first um, strategies in the um, self-talk strategy. You have to first be aware of what you're thinking about. Now, now that you've kind of thought about what you're thinking about and you're paying attention to it, if it was, if it was a positive thought, then I want you to say, you know that's right. You know that's right. That's something I would say, or say something that you would say. Oh yeah, girl, you got that. Oh yeah, girl, you you really you really showed out there. So again, I'm Southern. I'm a woman. That's how I talk to myself. Okay. If that statement in your mind was positive, I want you to affirm it. I want you to put some some positive energy behind it. And then throughout your day, do that. When you have those positive thoughts affirm them, you know, put some positive energy behind them. Now, if the thought was negative, think about it for a minute. I'm not saying put judgment behind it, but challenge it. Pick it apart a little bit and find a way to reframe it so that you can find some positive in it so that it shifts the energy. So let me give you an example. Oh my gosh, I have so much work to do right now. I have psych reports to write. I have presentations to give. I have a company that I'm running. Oh my gosh, so much work to do. That's stressful, that's anxiety provoking. Then I think about it and I reframe it. I'm like, gosh, you get to write this psych report that is allowing you to help a young person, something that you dreamed of doing when you were in high school. And look at you, you just started a company that's doing well, that's thriving, and you're living your dream in that way. And how many people wish that they could do the things that you're doing and you're doing it in the safety of a home. And you, you see what I'm saying? So you reframe it. So, oh my gosh, I'm not doing well on my job. I'm not doing well in school. How can you reframe that so that your self-talk is affirming and putting you in a better in a better position? So that's the self-talk strategy. And again, um, I can't see you all. So let me see. Can anybody put in the chat a reframing statement or a positive self-talk statement that you gave to yourself 
Um, I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can see if you all are with me still. So anybody put in the anything, any positive statement that you've given to yourself. That's a, that's a really powerful, monitoring your thoughts and figuring out how to, um, how to reframe, very, very powerful. Gratitude, I won't spend so much time on it because I think many of you have um, heard of this strategy, but I will say that it is very effective and it does change your vibrations when you, uh, when you tune your mind to find what you are, what you are grateful for. So starting your day with gratitude is um, really beneficial. So before you get out of the bed, what are you grateful for? And trying to be intentional about finding new things. You can even do it at night. And during the day, you can think about what you're going to write about, be it in a gratitude journal, if you want to just write it in a journal, um, there are gratitude jars, what you want to write about in a jar. Or you can be like me, I have an um, app on my phone that's a gratitude app, and I believe it's called Gratitude, and I type it in my phone, and I just and it sends me reminders when I didn't, because that helps me to stay on that frequency of what is positive, which also reduces stress. Breathing. So we hear a lot about deep breathing and some people say, oh my goodness, this is overrated. Um, however, we know that it is extremely important in terms of regulating um, the sympathetic nervous system and changing over to the um, parasympathetic. So two things I want to bring to your mind in terms of breathing are that a lot of people focus on the inhale breath but the inhale breath is actually linked to the sympathetic nervous system. So that's why when sometimes you're in a stressful situation, you may begin to hyperventilate and have short breaths because you're actually, again, getting your heart rate up and pumping blood. The exhale breath is actually what is more linked to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the relaxed and calm part of you. So for a few seconds, let's practice that. I want you all, instead of to focusing on the inhale breath, to empty your lungs as much as you can. So I'm gonna do it with you. <sighs> Emptied it so much I had to take a deep breath. So do that again. So you cut this time, since I emptied it without an inhale, I'm going to inhale for four seconds and I'm going to exhale for six seconds. And I hope you'll do that with me. So again, the focus is on the emptying of the lungs because that is what will bring your heart rate down and will get you back to the parasympathetic nervous system. So we're going to exhale. In four. Exhale six. So you can repeat that about 10 times. And again, focusing on the emptying. The emptying is what brings things down. So that is what is gonna get you back to a more relaxed and calmer state. Another breathing technique. Rich calories. Yeah, it burns calories. I love it. Yes, yes. I haven't, I haven't, had, that I haven't had that one yet. So uh, the next breathing technique we're going to talk about is the um, nostril breathing. So the nostril breathing is you breathe in through one nostril. You're going to hold usually for about four to five seconds. And then you're going to breathe out of the other nostril. The way that you do it is you start by holding down usually your right nostril with your right thumb and close it. And you're going to inhale through the left nostril. Then you're going to take your ring finger or your um, middle finger, whichever doesn't matter. And you're going to close your nose. You're going to close your nose for about four seconds or more if you can, if you want to extend it. And then you're going to open up the right nostril and breathe out. So you've actually switched sides. This has been shown to help your cardiovascular, cardiovascular system reduce stress, um, reduce your heart rate, 
it really is very beneficial and balanced your parasympathetic system. So I'm gonna demonstrate it really quickly, no matter how crazy it makes me look, anything for you all. Here we go. So I'm gonna have my nostril, my right nostril closed, and I'm gonna breathe in through my, my left nostril. I'm gonna breathe in through my right nostril. And you can repeat that about 10 times. And again, the, the longer you can hold the breath, the more benefit it will have in terms of just calming you down. And I know people who actually start their day that way. They start their day with stretching and breathing exercise. And these are just two. There are some really complicated breathing exercises um, that people can teach you. But those are two simple ones. Um, emptying your your um, your your lungs as much as possible and the nostril breathing. So you breathe in through one, you hold, you breathe out through the other and you just go back and forth for as long as you can. And the last one is mindfulness. And for that, there are many ways to practice mindfulness. What I will say is most important about mindfulness is to bring yourself to the present moment. So a lot of times when we're feeling stress or anxiety, we're thinking about something that could happen or that did happen, but we're not in the present moment. Nine times out of 10, the thing that we're stressed about that could happen is probably not gonna happen. And even if it does happen, it won't be as bad as how we imagine it to be. So if you're stressed about possibly some horrific thing happening, in that moment, what you can tell yourself is that I'm okay right now. Right now, I'm okay. And one of the ways that you ground yourself in the present moment, one technique is the 54321 technique, where you find five things that you can look at. You can choose a color, or you can just focus on five things. I can focus on my picture on my wall. I can focus on my window. I can focus on my lamp. I can focus on my refrigerator. I can focus on this chair. Five things that I see that will ground me in this present moment to keep my brain from going too far in the, in the future or heading backwards because we are okay right now. Four things that I can hear. Um, is it, no, is it four, no, four things that I can feel. So I can feel um, this dress on me and I can feel the fabric. I can feel this chair um, against my thighs and against my back. I can feel my shoes on my feet. I can wiggle my toes. So those are four things that I can feel. And then three things that I can hear. I hear a bus outside. I can actually hear my refrigerator and I hear myself talking right now. So that's three things I can hear. Um, and then two things, what is the two? Man, I don't know. And then the one thing that you can taste, right? You know, two things you can smell and then one thing that you can taste. And that's a way to kind of ground yourself in the present moment. And the last thing um, with mindfulness is you can pair mindful breathing and mindful being. So we have, we're going to end on um, a mindful exercise and then we're gonna have some questions and answer if we have time. Uh, let me go back. So here we go. Let me make sure that I'm sharing the sound. I don't think I was. Okay. I'm gonna do the mindful breathing and hopefully this will be just something to kind of um, get you in the mindset of how mindful breathing. Let's see if I can do it this way. It's not wanting me to do it when I'm in screen mode. So let me do it while I'm in this mode. The most important thing is for you to hear um, the voice. Mindful breathing. Close your eyes and rest your hands on your knees. Bring your attention to the body on your seat. Feel the weight of your body on your chair or cushion. Make sure that your back is straight and that you're comfortable. Take a few deep breaths while you're breathing deeply. Relax your shoulders stomach muscles, the 
muscles in your face, your hands, and your legs. Let go of all the tightness in your body. Now bring your attention back to your breath. Notice what it feels like as it enters through your nose, goes down through your throat, filling your lung, and back out through your nose. Notice your stomach and chest rise and fall each time you breathe in and each time you breathe out. And just allow your breathing to be natural and relaxed. Now bring your attention to the feeling of your breath in your nose. Feel your breath as it comes in and goes out. Just focus on this sensation, paying attention to each time you breathe in and each time you breathe out. Maybe your breath feels cool. And as you exhale, maybe it feels a little warmer. When your mind wanders, or if you become distracted, just notice what's going on in your head. And then gently bring your attention back to your breath, going in and out. Focus on the feeling of your breath and allow thoughts and feelings to become and go in the background. Now just bring your attention back to the touch of your body on your seat and open your eyes. So I hope that you all found that beneficial. I love her voice. Um, I love Thich Nhat Hanh's um, quote that mindfulness helps you go home to the present. Again, stress is oftentimes either in the future or the past. Bring yourself back to the present. And every time you go there and recognize a condition of happiness that you have, happiness comes. So that also ties into gratitude. So to close, monitor your thoughts, manage your expectations, practice gratitude, Eat healthy, exercise, and sleep. Pursue your passions. They help you to be whole. Set boundaries in relationships. Trust the process. So this is an ongoing life process to stay in touch with ourselves and figuring out what works for ourselves and healing ourselves. Ask for help when you need it. Create positive connections. Be mindful. Be your own BFF and keep the balance. There are people there who will help you if you are having difficulty. You have your fulfillment fund, um, college advisor, your colleges and universities also have student services. Use the student services. I did. It helped. Campus clubs and extracurricular activities, social networks within your family and friends. Reach out to the people that you can trust. Um, there are mobile apps, the, the apps um, that I have listed here, and Breathe Work is actually spelled correctly. They don't have an O in it for some reason. Um, Headspace, Calm, they um, also, some of them have uh, actual websites and the mindfulness app. And then YouTube, like the, um, the video that I showed you just now came from my life um, channel. And then there's mind peace, mindful peace and hands-on meditation. But again, you can just, you can just put in, put it in the search and you'll find, um, you'll find what you're, what you're looking for. All right. So reach out to your college advisor, like Rachel said. So here we are. I hope that you all got something out of the presentation. Some of it may have been refreshers, reminders. Um, many times people think, man, I don't have time to do self-care. I don't have time to um, be mindful. That mindfulness that we did was like three minutes and 16 seconds. I know it seemed longer, but it really was short. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. And what I have learned is the more that I make time to do these things, actually, the more efficient I am with getting things done. I'm more productive. 
So you really can't afford not to is what I, what I have come to find. All right. Any questions, any questions before we go? Any comments before you go? All right, before you go, if you don't have questions, can you tell me at least what you found most helpful or um, informative about the presentation? Or if there's a strategy that you think you're gonna use in your own mindful um, life. So in, in your own stress management, in your own balanced, holistic life, um, some of the things that you think that you're going to use. Some things that you've, the breathing techniques, the scientific explanations, it helps to understand our bodies. I wish that we spent more time learning how we actually work. We're, we're pretty amazing creatures. Anybody else, anything that you've learned that you can take with you? The breathing techniques. And again, they're great breathing techniques. I just showed you the ones that are simplest to me because again, I've been studying breathing techniques, but some of them are just way too complicated for me. So that I can do in the morning. Um, the importance of self-care is huge. Gratitude, huge. It really re resets you. It's hard to be grateful and anxious at the same time. So you want to Find those competing emotions. Laughter is fantastic. I didn't talk about math, laughter, but laughter is a competing emotion with stress. Sometimes when you're in a really stressful situation and somebody just cracks a joke, it, it relieves the tension. So laugh as much as you can. The breathing and meditation, um, five, four, three, two, one, five. Look for five things that you can use to ground you. What four things do you feel? What three things do you hear? What two things can you smell? And what one thing can you taste? Thank you. I'm glad you all enjoy the breathing exercises. Again, our breath is what um, resets our body. Awesome. Are there any questions? And if not, remembering the positives. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, remember that you are worthy of taking care of yourself, surround yourself with people who value you and the people who don't value you. Sometimes that's even in your family, you love them, but you can love them from a distance if you need to, because making sure that you're in a, a good positive space is extremely important. You're very welcome. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hart. That was amazing. That was great. I took so many notes for myself as well. Uh, you know, go from factors that amplify and diminish stress to holistic well-being and everything um, after that and in between. Thank you so much. I know our students are really going to enjoy this and really put this into practice. Thank you, team. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, without further, without further ado, thank you so much. And uh, hope you help yourself a great rest of your day and make sure you practice all your techniques that you learned today. Take care of yourself. You're worth it. Thank you.